This episode comes with a content and trigger warning. We discuss sexual assault and things of that nature. So if that's not for you, please um, skip forward. Good day, wherever you are at the time of the day that you're listening. This is Two Girls, One Pod. I'm one of the girls. One of the other girls today is so stunningly beautiful sitting across from me. And she's not even known for that beauty. Mm. Should be, isn't. Because you know what? That's not the most friggin' interesting thing about her. And it's not the most interesting thing about anyone, (laughs) how they look. Megan Luscombe, welcome. Thank you. Let me tell people who you are if they don't know. I know they already know who you are. (laughs) Megan Luscombe is a relationship and communication expert. Mm. Megan is an only child and mm-hmm. was raised by her nan. Yes. She's a ba- she abandoned religion, had married and divorced a man at 25, then later came out as queer and married her wife, Gwen. It's a great bio, by the way. I don't know yeah, who right. wrote it. <laughs> Megan offers individual business and couples coaching as well as coaching programs. Mm-hmm. Megan lives on the Mornington Peninsula with Gwen and their toddler, who I just saw a photo of, and they are divine. <laughs> she also has her own podcast, Real Talk with, guess who? Megan Luscombe. Welcome. Thank Pop you. Pop in the claps there, Ames. Oh, my goodness. What an introduction. What do you think about that, that bio? That bio Whoever wrote that, please do my bios from now until forever. Thank I you. I can introduce you to her. She is pretty good. That is very good. She... I've had a full life. Now, welcome. I'm really, really Thank glad you. that you're here because I know I've known you for a little while mm. and we have caught up and we have. we've had conversations and, you know, beautiful, heartfelt conversations, Absolutely. which I will, you know, hold dear to me Absolutely. for my whole life. So I'm really glad and honoured that you've so come in to be here. Thank you. So to I me. miss seeing your face. So to actually be here in person is awesome. Awesome. Yay. So how are you? I'm really... You know what? I'm mixed. It's just been heavy. Straight it's a up. Heavy time. How do you? How do you detach? Uh, I have my own coach that I work with, and they're brilliant. And yeah, they, they always are, aren't they? And they help the me. The therapist, therapist. Yep. They it's help what Brene me Brown unpacked. Yeah. I had to get, and mm-hmm. I, re- I remember going to see her, and she said it was. It wasn't until she got her own therapist. Mm-hmm. She's like, I don't need a therapist. I'm a therapist. <laughs> like, I'm a researcher. Yeah, it's what we all think, and then we're like, whoa. Yeah, no, we and really the real do. stuff started yeah. to come out for yeah. her, and absolutely, her life changed. Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose I'm very glad that I have people in my life and professionals in my life where I can decompress and yeah. I can, you know, uh, use boundaries to yes. not take on all of the emotional burdens of everyone. But still, you know, some of the time, the personal circumstances of your own life can make things really heavy. A lot, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. Do you ever feel like um, you have? Do you call them clients? Mm-hmm. Do you ever feel like there's someone that you can't, like, you, you're like, I, I, this is too much for me? Mm. Well, what's really good is I've I've really been able to nail my service to the point where people who aren't for me won't come to me. So that's one thing that I was really adamant about when I first yeah, started great. working. The transparency yes. of that. Like, I didn't want people to come to me for things that weren't my specialty, yeah, they weren't right. my area. So I've never had a client. that's an ego thing that yeah. you could have no done and, and people do do. No. Nah. It's so important, no incredibly way. important I to not take on I stay in my lane yes. with the areas that I'm good at. And, and be good at them, yeah. be great at them. Exactly. Like I, I do not want anybody ever coming to me where I can't help them. So I've made my website, my bios, my socials so clear that yes. you couldn't come to me for something that... I don't offer because I wouldn't. And even if ever they did, you would then it. say, oh, "I'd send them somewhere." Yeah, that's I have so resources great. where I'd be able to pass people on to. And generally, sometimes if people come to me and I've worked with them for let's say six months and they're ready for another chapter that I don't work in, mm-hmm. I transition them to the next person that they need. Because again, I'm only staying in my wheelhouse. <laughs> oh, so good. Yes. It, well, it's like anything, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You, you know, you start learning something in a, I guess things about yourself it's like a trade Mm -hmm. you start with your apprenticeship and you may need to move on or you know being promoted at work you go and you have a different manager a different you know mentor Mm -hmm. that is incredible to know we're Rosie Waterland and she she did a really she said a really to me profound thing and Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of response from it 
where people, she's been with the same um, psychologist for 20 years and mm-hmm. they're like, oh, geez, that's, a, you know, mm-hmm. how's it working if you've been with them for 20 years? Mm-hmm. And I'm, I knew the answer to yeah. that. You know the answer yeah. to that. But so many people don't realise that yeah. you have them for, you, you don't have, might have not them for life, yeah. but you should have therapy for life. Absolutely. And, you know, it's the, the amazing not a breakthroughs thing. she's had yeah. because of Absolutely. this relationship she yeah. has with her. Absolutely. And I think there's a big misconception that you go to a therapist or a coach or a counsellor for one singular yeah. problem and it's not how it works. You end up going for one thing and that transitions throughout your life like you might be going to talk about your relationship in one month and as after a year of working on that then you realize oh I'm lacking confidence when it comes to relationships with my family which is why we can see clients for years upon years because we're supporting them through multiple phases of their life yes and I think people think when you go when they hear I've been going to the same person for six years they think you're talking about the exact same issue yeah and you're not well, you're not you you're change not. on the daily you exactly. could my latest therapist um when I first started seeing her we had you know you have that first yeah, initial absolutely and I said oh there's this and there's this and there's this and oh and there's this and <laughs> she's like okay we got a lot to get through <laughs> but like, we're gonna start like she was great like yeah, we're gonna good. start here and that you know and I'd really like you to tell me yeah. what you'd like to, to be start guided. with. Yeah, and yeah that's like, great. Because she says, I know where we could start. Mm-hmm. But if what, <laughs> She's like, I'm, I'm ready based I'm on ready, what you've given yeah, me. But it's going to be a lot <laughs> and, and you're going to put my ch- non-existent children through college. So <laughs> yes, thank you it. for that. Yep. Now, with relationships, what is in therapy, mm-hmm. what is the most common problem that you, you Communication. come Communication. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of couples operate... Tell me about it. Sorry, (laughs) I was just communicating. (laughs) A lot of couples operate on the basis of my partner should know me inherently without having Mm. to communicate what I need or what I want. And it's probably one of the most biggest illusions of relationships. It's the expectation that because we are in a romantic partnership that you can anticipate my needs and know my needs without me actually opening my mouth, this whole mind-reading territory. And I see it time and time again with couples. One will say, well, we've been together for so long, they should just know that's what I want. And that's not how relationships work. It's not how friendship, it's, any relationship, exactly. your relationship exactly. with your parent. Yeah. No but the thing is, work like we that. have more uh, expectations of romantic dynamics than we do for every other relationship. We, do, we don't give we? so much grace to friendships. Yeah. Like your friend can treat yeah. you terribly and you allow it. But no, your romantic partner, oh, oh, they couldn't get away with it. There's such a, you know, Why discrepancy. Well, because society tells us that romantic relationships are the pinnacle of life. This is where you need to focus all of your attention. And that's also another big lie. It and is, it's just this it? patriarchal lie. It is, isn't Like, it? you know, take care of your partner. You know, it's just this, it's this, it's toxic monogamy. Yes, like, and that you've succeeded if yes, you get there. And yes, and when you do get there, then if you leave, if you divorce, if yeah. you grow outside of each other and realise we're no longer aligned, you've failed. Yes. Which is just... Success, failure. Oh. Like, off. No, it's yeah, just learning. We learned. Yes. We grew. We learned. We changed. Yes. And you can leave relationships and treat each other with kindness and knowing that it's been a good how many years, but you know what? It's, it, it's not it's for us now. anymore. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, then you've got the equation of children mm-hmm. if there is those mm-hmm. in it and that's a tether Yeah, that is for life. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be for some, but it mostly is. Yeah. And that's another layer mm-hmm. of... Communication. Absolutely. That you need to learn how to um, talk. We, we always talk about greedy people, like God solicitors. <laughs> Aren't they making money? Like, you, people just find the weaknesses in the world, don't yes. they? And they just prey on them. Absolutely. And I just think if couples took more time to really communicate, yeah. they'd just be better off for it. Yeah. You know, and there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, we've never really sat down and talked about a strategy for how we need to communicate. I think they just assume they're going to find their way. And yeah. that's not how the world works. You never just start a job and find your way. You get taught things, like yeah. you learn things. Yeah. But with a relationship, I feel like people go, oh, these are just skills we should automatically pick up. 
No, it's not like that. No. Don't let it. And you shouldn't want it to be like that. Like if you want to be successful at relationships, you need to do the work and work with people who can help you be successful at relationships. I I do understand where that comes from. Mm. I come from a family who didn't talk about anything. um, And I still have a problem with – so I don't have relationships with – romantic relationships because I have just been treated so badly Mm -hmm. by everyone I've been out with and in turn have not dealt well in relationships myself Mm -hmm. um, because I over-communicate or miscommunicate or I don't communicate. Yeah. And um, it, you know, would be seen as a nag, would be seen as Mm. or – and. In friendships, I just I don't like conflict. Yep. So I find that incredibly hard yeah. to. But the older I'm getting, mm-hmm. just like you said, I'm learning yeah. how to have conversations with. And I think at the end of the day, it's people you trust. Absolutely. And who actually honour you and value yeah. you and they're not going to take you the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And if they do, they might just do that initially. Yeah. And Because that, that's the ego, the Absolutely. defensiveness. And then they go... No, I'm here. Absolutely. I'm listening. Okay, I took that badly because, you know, I thought that was you pointing it at me. And yeah. When you get a like a couple come in and you – can you tell if they're not going to work? Uh, look, you can tell the couples who are so set in their own individual ways that if they don't get out of their own way that the relationship will falter. Mm-hmm. Um, but – the cu- you can tell the people who are doing it to check a box, mm-hmm. like, oh, they said they wanted to come, so I'm doing it. However, they're the people who need help the most. Yeah. You know, they're the – like, yeah. every couple that comes to me, it's – somebody's hurting and somebody's not hearing. And yeah. it's an opportunity to hold space for both individuals to have somebody who can hear them from an unbiased ear. And when we're in relationships, we have our own biases when our partners or our friends talk to us. We've made assumptions about who they are based yeah. on past. So I'm able to sort of hear things from a non-judgmental lens. Yes. Because I don't know these people behind in their relationship. I know them from what I'm seeing in front yes. of me. So I suppose when couples are in that space, I think it allows them to sort of realise that, hey, if we actually also looked at ourselves from this non-biased perspective without judgment, maybe we could fix this. Yes. Can I also say I think it's incredibly important to see a professional? A hundred percent. Please get off Google. Stop listening to relationship podcasts about how to fix things. No, that stop talking to your friends about things that they are not qualified. Absolutely. And they're biased. I spoke to two friends yesterday, one friend in the morning, um, who I haven't spoken to since December last year mm-hmm. because I needed a break. Yep. But I didn't know how to verbalise that mm-hmm. to her. And the other one who heard my solo ep this week was talking about something that she had done that had hurt me. Mm. And she said, was that me? And I said, it was. Mm-hmm. And, well, oh, I'm really sorry that I hurt you, you know. Why didn't you kind of... And I said, you know what, sometimes... And I said it to both of them, completely separate of each other, knowing that I had this similar conversation with each of them, was I worked that out with my therapist instead. So me retelling a story, you know, thank you for, Mm -hmm. you know, she didn't get defensive, she didn't get blamey or anything, but I said to talk to you about it, you might have taken it the wrong way. Or And the other friend who said, you know, I'm just so sorry I haven't been there for Mm -hmm. you. I wish you had let me in for the last, you know, 10 months. Mm -hmm. And I said, I got sick of hearing myself vent to you all the time. And she said, but I didn't. I said, I know you didn't and you were always there, Mm -hmm. but you became such a crutch for me that you weren't giving me professional advice. Yeah. You were too close. Yeah, absolutely. And I needed to go absolutely. and talk to the professional because yeah. it can be extremely damaging. It really can. It really can. And sometimes you can't undo those damages. That's right. And I think whilst I do think it's great that people read books and they do listen to podcasts, there's nothing wrong with getting inspiration and maybe some ideas from yes. these avenues. They're all brilliant for that. But it's important to remember that when you go to a therapist, you're talking about individualised issues and yes. circumstances. Yes. And there's no podcast that can cover no. your exact 
life experience or relationship experience and your friends are going to give you bias based on what they want for you. Yes. And sometimes what they want for you goes directly against your value system or what is actually best for you, which is why when we go to a professional and we go sit to the, you know, like me, the coaches of the world and the yes. counsellors of the world, we're able to help you find your solution yes. without taking in the background noise of all of your friends and family's projections. Yeah, it's amazing because we do so many individualised things in other parts of our life. Yeah. <laughs> but I get it. It's a hard thing. I always say to people, you need to get your hands dirty. Yes. that's. I've always said it. Mm-hmm. If you don't, it's like gardening. If you don't get your hands in, yeah. how you know? How do you know what your root system's yeah. doing? How Absolutely. do you know what is needed? How Absolutely. do you know what's wet or dry? Or yep. you got to get your hands dirty. Absolutely. And what you end up with in that garden? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. Labor of love. Labor you did all of, of love. it. You know, you tended it. You yeah. did the work, and that's what yeah. makes it more enriching. With it, whether it be a friendship, a romantic partnership, a family dynamic like anything, or just your relationship with yourself. Yeah. Like you've done the work, which is what makes it that much more rewarding. Do you do do much with people who have had like abuse or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I found that one thing over, I mean, I've been doing this for close to 15 years, sometimes people just want a session with me so I can listen to them. Yeah. Because sometimes people don't want to be therapised. They don't want help. They just want someone to go, hey, can you listen to my story because I haven't been able to tell any of my friends or any of my family or I'm not ready to do that yet. So can you just be an ear? Yes. And I'm like, yeah, yes. I'll, I'll just be your ear because in, the, in that instance, I'm not actually doing anything. It's no. not like I'm stepping out of a wheelhouse. I'm just listening to you. So there's a lot of friends who can't do that. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And a lot of in relation, especially, you know, self-confessed and professed men who mm-hmm. are fix-its, oh, soldiers. I, I How have I had this? a lot of male clients over my career who just want someone to listen to them. Oh. And, I mean, I love listening to people. Mm-hmm. It's like one of the most privileged experiences that I have in my job is so being able to listen. I'm so glad you said that. Like, that's just such a lovely thing to hear. Oh, I love – I I always say I'm obsessed with it in my job and the work I get to do, but it's because I know – the privilege it holds. Yes. Like the fact that somebody has chosen to not only spend money on my service, but to know that they can trust me with sometimes their biggest life secrets. Like that means a lot. Oh, I'm really glad. Thank you for saying that because, you know, as as a patient myself personally and so many others, Mm -hmm. you, you need to hear that from, you know, not your therapist, but a therapist, you know, that they're doing it for the right reasons. Absolutely. Um, So that, what do you think about like all the me too, movement mm. and the I guess the most recent one would be Russell Brand, you know, which seems to have gone really quiet. I was have about you to noticed? say that. It's actually, it has gone a bit quiet. Uh, it um, has. I think there's probably so many other disastrous media stories going on right now in the world. Yeah, that's that true. It's just been put on the back burner. Put, yeah, like it'll come back out. Yeah. It'll, it'll so get the, more momentum. The show Dispatches, which is in the UK, mm-hmm. um, did – a very long, I think, six-year investigative, I hate that word, journalistic yep. piece, um, and they researched it for that long, investigated for him for that long. Yeah. Um, not him, yeah, the four victims. Yeah. And what's come out since, which what I find really interesting, mm-hmm. is the amount of comedians who've come yeah. out and said, oh, he was, you, we all knew, we would be told when you started in comedy, yeah. don't go into his dressing yeah. room. Which is such boy club mentality as well yeah. but obviously the women some women were told that as well like he's oh this comedian this person stay away from that expect this like you know anticipate this type of behavior from that person which is terrifying it just gets such a green mm. light doesn't oh. it and there's just so many mm-hmm. and there's so i i honestly do not know a woman <laughs> who hasn't been no essayed in some Oh, absolutely. Way. Same. Yeah? Same. Yeah. Same. I mean, I think I think it would be very hard to find a woman who hadn't been. Very hard. Like, I feel like really hard. I feel like You'd really, really, have to look. really, really hard. Yeah. And even if you did find one and then you explained exactly yeah, that'd go, what oh, it was. Yeah. Wait a minute. Actually, no. Yeah. <laughs> that one time. Yeah. yeah that that's one time. time. Just yeah. the date raping that goes on. Yeah. Like, it, it sounds so bad, but mm-hmm. it's such a soft... 
yeah. SA, yeah. So- sexual assault, is what yeah. those letters stand for. It's such a soft one, isn't it? Mm-hmm. There's a, um, and especially teenage girls, yes. there is such a given to uh, exchange mm-hmm. thanks in yeah. that way. Yeah, absolutely. It's this power dynamic. Yeah. It's the power dynamic of you have something over me or something that I want or something that I want to achieve, or you're in the arena of something that I want to achieve. So it's best for me to follow suit, take, yeah, yeah. do what you need me to do and be who you need me to be. Yeah. And I think that is something that more women are becoming more confident and speaking about, which is is so sad and awful that we're having these conversations based on these experiences. But I think it helps the other women who have gone through it and maybe feeling a little bit alone and unseen and unheard and unvalidated. It helps to know that your therapist in some way has maybe gone through something similar. How, what's that like as a therapist with a client? Like, do you ever tell like on oh, my own experience, own based on my own experience, it's actually really interesting. I think I've spent so long working in the realms of relationships and business mm. that I haven't really had to, you know, sort of step into this storyline of my life. And I suppose nobody, there's only a few people in my life that would know my own experience of being groomed when I was 16. So you were groomed? Absolutely. Can you talk about that? Yeah, abs- yeah, I absolutely can. And it's something that I, younger me is so desperate to talk about. How old are you now? Uh, right now I'm 37, 37. turning 37. So what, were you 16? Yeah, I was 15 turning 16. Uh, and so 22 years ago. Yes. <laughs> yes. And you've never really spoken about no, it? I have never spoken about it. This is actually the first time I'm speaking about it publicly. Really? Only two people in my life know about this. Oh, my God. My best friend and my wife. Oh, that my is God. It. And I I think speaking about it is from a place of education and from a place of removing shame. Yes. And I think women in particular feel so shameful for situations that they've been in where it wasn't their fault. I mean, I was 16, the person I'm who was the authority was mm. in their late 30s. You know, that's... That, oh, my God. That, you know, so even that age of that you are at now, they were at that. Yes, and I think that's why it's come up so much for me now because I am I am that age. Yes, and, and you have a child. That's right. And you-, and, you know, when you have children, basically rips apart your whole sort of identity and you start to unpack and repack and unpack and repack. The amount of women who are... If I hear the words aimed at them, why do they take so long to come in? They cannot come out, God, to, to <laughs> yeah. talk, to report. Yeah. Like, oh, my God, they're making yeah. it up because who no, yeah. who takes that long? Yeah. And that's the thing. I To have the courage to be able to share something that is so inherently shameful mm. about your past, no one's making this stuff up. No Like one. nobody just randomly like says, oh, by the way, oh, by the way, I was groomed. Lol. <laughs> what? No one makes that up. <laughs> no one like, makes that up. Like no one makes up. that up. And I think that's what baffles me when, and I feel for anybody who has gone through any type of sexual assault or grooming or any predatorial situation where they have felt unable to share their story because of fear of no one's going to believe me. You know, yeah. there is no time stamp on when you get to talk about something that happened in your life. So you're talking to me about it right mm. now. Why haven't you talked about it before? Um, I haven't talked about it because it has. It was something that I compartmentalised really, really, really well. I, I shut it down. I put it in a part of my brain where I didn't need to talk about it because when I went through it, I created, you know, in therapy we have – sort of areas of our brain and our personalities where we will create defence mechanisms to protect us, to yeah. to make sure we can survive and do things. So my 16-year-old self created defence mechanisms in order to not have to talk about it, to not have to share the experience because if I had have shared the experience, I was scared of the, the backlash that I would have got at the time of, well, I mean, I'm 37 now and, and women still hear, hear the what were you wearing what did you do that would make them do that to you? Surely you've led that on, all of those experiences. And and now as a, you know, 37-year-old, I can go, well, that's ridiculous. Like, that wasn't your fault. You were you were completely the victim in that situation. But growing up as a 16-year-old 20 years ago, 
Absolutely not. Can you give me any details about like how you met this person? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. Once upon a time, there was a, uh, a website called Melband. <laughs> oh, God, I loved Melband. Yes, yes. So I was an aspiring um, singer songwriter. Yes. And I ended up responding to an ad of a producer who was looking for people to start um, just recording tracks so they could get their experience up. Okay, yeah. Right? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to do it. And I've got some, you know, uh, ambitions and, yes. you know, and that was a time Australian Idol was on. Yes. You know, so I'm all, I'm all in. I'm like, let's get this music career, you know. I'm yeah. Just, Rob Millsy, watch. <laughs> Watch me. I'm coming for you. Come right? on, bright eyed and bushy <laughs> exactly. tail. You're ready for the exactly. world. Exactly. I was ready for the world. And so I met this person and the first few meetings were fine. Really good. Like really surface level, professional, professional. fine. And they have they, to be, don't they? Yes. And when I look back on it now, I notice all the peppered comments of, oh, you'll have to do a lot of things if you want to make it in the industry. And now I can hear them for what they were. Yeah. And they were all just litmus tests. They were just tests <sighs> to, to, see, to see to see how malleable yes. you are. Yes. And of course I was oh I'm absolutely I'm if ready you're to do anything. Be a good victim. Because to yeah. me, anything to me is you've got to work hard. Right? That's right. You've gonna you're gonna have to, you know, write song after song and be ready yes. to be in the recording studio. Like to yeah, me as a sixteen year old, yeah, that's I'm what hearing that because to me that's what he a musician yeah. is, right? That's yeah. what I think I have to do. And so I suppose over the next three to four months, it became a sort of wear me down, wear my confidence down. Right. So and the nagging then yes. started. Oh, you could get that note better. Yeah, that that note's shit house. You can you can sing better than that. You're never going to get anywhere if you you know. Don't. So it started the erosion of my confidence, and then it led into. Do you know what would make you a lot more confident? If we started taking some photos of you without your top on. Because of the vulnerability. Exactly. Right? If you can do that, exactly. expose yourself. Exactly. You it's going to help so you so much strong. on stage. Oh, my God. You're going to be able to do anything. It won't matter what a producer says to you. And in, in Holy shit, yep. that's good. Yep. Right? To a 16-year-old yep. brain, mm-hmm. that is good. Yeah. So... I oh, say and to women, myself, women need yes, that, you know, they're empowering yeah, me. Empowering. Oh, this is going to be so liberating for me. And, but there was a part of my brain that was really uncomfortable. And, yeah, I, and, I, and I was like, oh, no, I don't really think, no, I don't, no, I don't want to do this. You don't want it enough. <sighs> it's all right. I've got other people who I can work with. What's a 16 year old who wants to break into the music industry going to do? I'm going to do what you've just said. Yeah. And get your tits out, yeah. aren't you? And I'm, and, they say, hold a candle, we'll make it really artistic. <laughs> Saying this out loud now. <laughs> hold a candle, it'll make it artistic. Yeah, cool story. <laughs> if you um, can't laugh, you That's cry. the thing. I can laugh about it. Exactly. I can laugh about those yeah. things now. You can do both. And, you can yeah, do both. Look, sometimes I do yeah. cry about it. Yes. But right now, but, yeah. like, that to me is funny. So I'm holding <laughs> this candle and I'm not even making eye contact and I've disassociated. I, it's my first memory of disassociation ever right. in my life. And... He has moved my breast, so he's actually touched me and moved it because it had to had to put it out of the way. And I was very voluptuous how, how at sixteen. How floppy were your boobs? They weren't. They were ginormous. I had ginormous boobs when I was in high school. Huge, huge, huge boobs. Enough and, that he could move one. Yep. And I just completely disassociated. Oh. And then after he's finished the photos, taken them, and I'm like racing, putting my top back on. But the kicker is when they then led me into their house and their wife comes out and the wife's pregnant, by the way. And in that moment, I realised that I have to lie to protect myself and them. So what do I do? I start panicking inside. Oh, my gosh, what, what have we just done? What have we just done? And, she, and she's unbeknownst to her, and you know, oh, how'd it go? How was the... How's it all going? Where are you? Do you want a cup of tea? Where are you? Super lovely. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, it was great. It was great. I couldn't get out of there quick enough. But from that moment on, I, I made this sort of conclusion in my mind that I have to lie for him. And that disassociation just continued. And the, the inappropriateness of every time I was there, there were comments regarding my body, getting naked, and it was just... Horrendous. And then where did it go? Uh, I reckon probably about 
five, six months went by and I just started feeling disgusting. Mm. I started feeling despondent, depressed. Yeah. And I just said music wasn't to me. Like, oh. And I, so and I f***ed music yeah, up. Yeah, it did. For and you. I love music. And it took me until I was probably 31, 32 to even write a song again. Oh, darling. Because I was so consumed by getting into this, into this industry means abuse. Yeah. And the alarming thing is, is for some people that is still happening. Like for I'm, so I'm, many. you know, I'm not a, a one-off story. Mm-mm. This is like this is a tale as old as time in the industry. Absolutely. And it was actually M. Rusciano who posted a comment on threads about. Uh, how somebody had inappropriately grabbed her bum at oh, a yeah. comedy gig. Yes. And it was that that actually prompted me to comment and say, hey, this is what has happened to me as well. And and I and I remember talking to my wife and saying, you know, this isn't – these aren't singular incidences. No. They're huge and they're, very, they're so across the board and so many so of us. So varied. And that's why I'm – I think I'm now deciding to become more vocal about it because yes. I know if I'm saying it happened to me, there's going to be another 40, 50 people out. Like these these people don't focus on one. Oh, my goodness, They are no. looking for multiple victims. This is not just a me thing and I know that. And I want Absolutely. women who are listening to know that they're not alone in these experiences. Like we have each other. Yeah. Like, And that's the only reason I really want to speak about it because I'm not ashamed of it. Yeah. It took me a while to get over that shame because I felt like I'd put myself in a situation where I deserved that. But Oh, God, yeah. But, I mean, as a 16-year-old, and like it wasn't like I went home and talked to my family about it. I didn't feel like I could talk to anyone about it. So no. I only had my own dialogue oh. to, to go off and uh, society's dialogue to go off at the time. You know, Me Too wasn't around when I was 16. You're just a little slurry, yeah. aren't you? <laughs> right. With your tits with, out. With a candle. Not even a good oh. one. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But <laughs> it took me, you know, a good amount of time with a therapist to realise why I had such a negative association to my breasts. Hated them. Would never get them of out. Of course. Hated wearing anything with a of low... Of course. Hated wearing anything with a low-cut top. Never wanted anybody to touch my breasts. Romantic partners or anything, don't look at them, don't be near them. Hello. Makes sense. Of course. Yes. Right. And there's, and the music. Yeah. The breasts and the music. They're yep. the two things that suffered. Absolutely. As well as you. Yeah. Those three things that mm-hmm. majorly suffered from Absolutely. an incident <laughs> oh, from some predator. Absolutely. Who, a predator. Exactly. A predator. And that's where we've got to be able to start using that language more. There are so many predators yes. going on in yes. this world. And I was just telling a woman yesterday um, who was an ex-midwife and mm-hmm. we were talking about um, fostering dogs and things yeah. like that. And I was telling her about um, the little foster dog that I have um, that she's interested in. I said, oh, her vulva has a lump on it, but mm-hmm. it doesn't look sinister in any way. And she was like, that's oh, so interesting, you know, that you use the word vulva instead of vagina. And then I was like, yeah, it's really important. I think it's really important. Plus, yeah, language I've matters. worked with children for such a long And I'm, you know, a sexual abuse victim. So um, once I got working with children, so... 20, 30 years ago, yeah. it um, it was a thing on Oprah that once there was an, um, a child specialist that came on and said, you must always use the correct terminology Absolutely. for all anatomy. Language matters. Including especially your um, genitals because yeah. predators hate the real words. Absolutely. And then she was like, what? She said to me yesterday, what What do you mean? I said, oh, well, you know, like if a, if a predator says, you know, that's your little button, mm-hmm. if you, if you then if the child ever repeats the word, mm-hmm. mum and dad don't know, like, what button means. That's it could exactly be an actual right. button. Exactly. You know, it's really important. I said there's nothing more frightening for a predator than mm-hmm. a child to say, don't touch my vagina. Yeah, exactly. Why is your hand on my vulva? Yeah, exactly. Knowledge is power. And, so powerful. And using the correct word and terminology matters. It, it really, really does. does. I I will wear the same when it comes to my toddler. Yeah, we great. refer to his penis. Yes. And if we're talking about the shaft, cleaning the shaft of his penis. Yes. And his testicles. And the foreskin like, and the, all of the things. All of it. All of it. No, we don't say anything. And his elbow anything. and his ears. Yes. And it, it's all. It all na- matters. Yeah. It all matters. All matters. Yes. Um, so if you're listening now and, you know, you do have any kind of nicknames yeah. for your body parts, change that. 
immediately, Change it immediately and explain to your partner if you have one why yeah. you're doing that and um protect our kids a little bit more yes. in such a small way yes. you know this is just the beginning cuz just like Megan said language matters it and does. if if it can make a such a massive difference from such a small thing. Yeah. Can you imagine how many lives you're about oh to save? Oh, my goodness. But also then they – empowering our children to use the right terminology allows other people around them to use the right terminology. Yes. And I think, you know, um, vulva vagina getting mixed up all the time – Come on, let's yeah. actually start using the words yeah. for what they are. So let's do it. So if P, if our children are then consenting adults and having sexual experiences, they actually know what they're talking about and they know what to specifically say and ask for. Yes, like yes. Don't don't say touch my vagina. Yes. Maybe they'll be able to say, "I like it when you touch my vulva." Yes, like, or things yeah, matter. Or major, my, my labia. Yes, and I absolutely. remember having sex with a guy once. This is a TMI. If it's too much for you, please fast forward right now. <laughs> but I remember him trying to f- me with his tongue. Mm, yeah, and I said, "Why no?" And the thing is, th- it was that was whatever. Yeah, it was a conversation with two straight male friends mm-hmm. over breakfast the mm-hmm. next day. I'm telling them a funny story. Yeah, both of them. I watched their faces, their eyes change. Because they went, I, I do that. What? <laughs> what do you? And they were like, oh, what, what do you, what what do you mean? mean? I was like, like, that it. isn't it. No, That's not it's it. not. Like, do you know what the clitoris yes, is? Do you know where it is? Stop playing like a DJ booth, by the way. Yeah, your penis <laughs> often goes inside your vagina. Often, but, Often, you know, yes. your tongue, yeah. not so much. Mm. Like, you know, I'm holding up a pinky and holding up a fork and going, guys, yeah, let's, right. you know. And this is why anatomy and language matters. Yeah, Words and I matter. remember they were probably like four or five years younger than me and I was only about 30 at the time. Yeah. So I was like, got two, this is great. <laughs> I said, spread it. Tell your mates that as well. That's it. This is why communication in sex exactly. is so incredibly important. Matters. But for me, still, I was useless, still mm-hmm. useless. Like, I didn't even do tell the guy properly. Yeah. I was still like, what are you doing? But didn't uh-huh. go, this is what you should be doing because Absolutely. I didn't want to embarrass him. Yeah, and that's, that's where so shame exists. So let's fake another for- orgasm. Mm-hmm. Shame. Oh, God. We are running out of time. Just, just thank you for coming on, but oh, thank, thank you for, for sharing me. that. No, thank because, you. I really hope it's yeah, able to help someone yeah. or maybe make somebody think differently or maybe share their own experience yes. with their therapist. This isn't a yes. you need to go tell your friends if you don't want to or no. you don't need to do it on a public space no. just like this. It's okay. There's no expectation to, but hopefully it encourages somebody to go, I can talk about my experience with a confidant and and feel accepted yeah. and heard and valued. Holding it in, yeah. how heavy is that? Oh, my gosh. Isn't that an awful feeling? So heavy. So I'm very glad for it to be. Thank you so um, much for talking and, and trusting Thank me you for being a safe to, space. Oh, you are so welcome. You're more than welcome. Um, tell me where people can find you. Uh, they can find me on Instagram at Megan Luscombe underscore. But side note, I'm not showing up in the search for Instagram. It haven't been for about... Are you a bit shadow banned? Um, for 12 months. Oh. Um, so, uh, uh, if you're you... a little slurry. <laughs> that's just getting punished yeah. for being a little like bit the, too yeah, naughty. That's right. But um, uh, you can find me online, online. meganluscombe.com.au. Meganluscombe.com.au. And all my links are there, so then you can click through to And stuff. what's your podcast? Is Real Talk with Megan Luscombe. Well, that's nice. <laughs> um, thank you again for so much for thank coming you. in. My I pleasure. know everyone that's listening has really gotten a lot out of that if you liked this episode please let me know or let megan know um what resonated for you or you know if you want to talk to either of us um we still highly recommend seeing a therapist Mm. um megan is a therapist so she's got that on me already but if you just want to tell me that you're going to see a therapist um i'm up for that or if you need to just tell me something tell me if you like the show please rate review subscribe five stars only obvs obviously um i'll be in your ear holes on tuesday with my solo app with um a dm or an email or a female or a shemale or a pigeon um if you've got something you want to tell me about or ask me about please email us two girls one pop us i mean us by i mean me and my producers um megan won't get that email 
twogirlsatnovapodcast.com.au or slide into my DMs. Oh, sliding. I love that word. It's just it is a, great a word. slippery word yeah. and I like it because it, it just conjures it's moist, a good moistness. Yeah, love it. And another one with moist because that means cake. Um, I love you. Thank you. Goodbye.